Last month, we saw the U.S. Embassy there shut down and staff pulled out because of the worsening political crisis and the unrest. There has been a lot of concern about the impact of a reduced or non-existent U.S. presence in Yemen on the counter-terrorism operations there. The country is a main base for one of al-Qaeda's most powerful franchises. Down to business. Welcome to Midpoint, research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the lead analyst on al-Qaeda for the AIE Critical Threats Project, Catherine Zimmerman. And welcome back retired U.S. Army Major General and veteran military analyst, Paul Vallely. I thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Ed. Catherine, let me begin with you, because there are those who say, this is Yemen, no big deal, another country out in the middle of nowhere. Our guys are gone, no sweat. They need to understand that this is a huge hit to the United States when it comes to intel in the Middle East, is it not? It's certainly a big deal in Yemen, and we are losing our ability to conduct uh, airstrikes, and that's a key component of the Obama administration's strategy in Yemen. We have lost the ability to conduct the type of intelligence that we need to understand the threat coming out of Yemen. And today, we're seeing the Islamic State appearing in Yemen, which is a fundamental shift. And it's not just like Iraq and Syria. This is a country that is very different contextually that could walk down the Iraq and Syria route, which would be very concerning for the United States. Are we looking at a nation, even though it's the Houthi rebels right now who are basically the ones involved, where a group like ISIS, Catherine, can walk in and this almost could become their caliphate state at the end of the day? It's not clear that ISIS is, is in Yemen in, in a very strong fashion. Um, obviously, the attacks on Friday were the signal that ISIS has arrived to Yemen. The country itself is, is, is really not as sectarian as Iraq is today, as Syria is today. Um, and Yemenis don't identify along sectarian lines. The problem is the conflict is driving that way. And that could create conditions where ISIS is accepted, the Islamic State is accepted. Um, but the other thing to recognize is that al-Qaeda has had a long-term sanctuary in the country. It has the ability to operate. And so what we might see is actually ISIS and al-Qaeda operating in Yemen and competing against each other to see who packs the biggest punch. Major General Vallely, let me ask you, because Catherine just brought the words al-Qaeda into this discussion as well. Do we now need to realize that al-Qaeda has beaten America in Yemen? Well, radical Islam has in the spread of the caliphate, Ed, that's for sure. And uh, whether you call them al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, uh, Islamic State, uh, they're all uh, uh, committed to uh, the global uh, control and the introduction of Sharia law around the world. So as they take uh, different areas, as we've seen in Iraq, in Syria, Yemen, in Libya, we see uh, down in Nigeria, they're on the march. And so the model that President Obama talked about, there's good models and bad models. This is a model for failure. When the president came out and made his statement about Yemen be, being a success, Major General, do you think that possibly at that time, it doesn't make a difference whether it's Houthis, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever they said, America thinks that's a success, we're going to get in there and we're going to prove to them what we can do. They use this as a target. Possible? Well, it is possible, uh, absolutely, as uh, happened uh, in Libya, again, another, another good example. But uh, when you have uh, uh, deception, uh, continued deception out of the uh, White House uh, at about our uh, involvement anywhere over there. And what the true story is, once you get on the ground, and as you know, I've been over in the Middle East five times in the last two years, the reality speaks for itself over there. Everybody that's over there, including General al-Sisi and others, King Abdullah, they see the reality of what's happening over there. But our CIA under uh, John Brennan, uh, Valerie Jarrett, uh, Susan Rice, they seem to be clueless about what actually is going on or they're following their deceptive agenda to uh, keep the information and the truth from the American people as they continue down the road to uh, diminish, uh, to, uh, I guess, uh, lower the power uh, of the United States around the world. And therefore, uh, we sit in a situation where we have no credibility or respect. Catherine, 20 seconds left before we take a break. Is this one of those moments that we need to point to America and say, this is your government lying to you? I think it doesn't matter whether the administration thinks it's telling the truth or not. What we need to do is look to America for leadership in the region. That's what, the, that's what is being asked for, and that's what we need.
All right. Well, we're going to take a break, come back, and we're going to continue this conversation because certainly there's a tremendous amount more here. The intelligence damage it has been done now. Because while you sit at home and think, wait a minute, what does this really mean to America? This does have wide ranging implications because what happens in the Middle East sooner or later comes home to America. And there's a new hit list featuring American soldiers and their families. Next on Midpoint. If there is one thing ISIS and their band of killers are good at, it's social media and media marketing. They've struck once again from the ethereal internet mists, this time with something called the Islamic State Hacking Division, posting the names, photos, and home addresses of 100 U.S. military service members and, of course, urging their lemmings around the world to kill them. Back to it, returning his research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the lead analyst on al-Qaeda for the AIE Critical Threats Project, Catherine Zimmerman, along with retired U.S. Army Major General and veteran military analyst, Paul Vallely. Major General, let me get to you right now with regard to these service members who are now being threatened with their lives. Isn't, I, I know this is difficult to say, but shouldn't we just say this comes with the territory here in 2015 because they will look to do anything they can. Social media opens up these doors and every member of the armed services has got to be watching their back 24-7. Well, absolutely. Whether they're overseas or uh, located in bases in the country, look at what happened down at Fort Hood uh, when we had 13 uh, of our soldiers killed down there. And our armed forces, the members, they're active in the social media, of course, Facebook, uh, uh, as well as uh, Twitter and, and the others. And so uh, to hack into that and get their names uh, is very easy to do for, for sophisticated hackers. And you know, uh, ISIS uh, has recruited those out of Great Britain and the United States with those uh, technology type of skills. So they're on top of it, and that's why we have to be very, very careful and everybody in the armed forces, you know, I was uh, on the hit list uh, from ISIS last year because I went into Syria. So I understand what the dynamics are of being targeted like that. So uh, we, our guard has to be up and we have to make sure that the system protects uh, our people that are in the armed forces and not give access or easy access to any information that may be out there that ISIS could use against us. Let me get to that system and that easy access. Catherine, this comes to you because while indeed there are hackers out there working on government servers, in this case, even the Defense Department is saying most of the information could be found in public records, residential address search sites, and social media. Haven't we reached a point where we've got to do a better job protecting our people from being this exposed? Because this is ridiculous. You can find anybody now. It is. It's a great threat to the American people. But I think that we need to realize that the threat actually comes from the global jihadist movement, as the Major General noted that there is a momentum that's driving this threat against our people. Um, and we really can't just sit here and buckle down and, and put up the hatches to protect us, but we need to address the threat where it's coming from. Catherine, then knowing what we've just talked about and the list that's here, but certainly the fact that we are now out of Yemen for all intents and purposes, we have no one on the ground, at least nothing that we're told about. What do we do? What does the American military, in your opinion, first of all, do and the foreign policy need to do? Because if we don't get back in there, this could set us back, as some people have told me, years in our intel. That's certainly the question of the day, is, is what the next step is. I honestly believe that the first step is admitting that our strategy has failed in Yemen. I haven't quite heard that coming from the administration. But you don't expect that to really come out of the administration, do you, Catherine, honestly? No, I don't. Um, but I do expect to see a fundamental shift in policy because it seems like a joke to continue to pursue a strategy that has clearly failed and when the assumptions are now proven false. You know, I remember what my father told me a long time ago. He told me what the word assume was, and I'm certainly, we have all heard it exactly what it is. So, Major General, I come to you right now. This assumption that America is doing the right thing, these assumptions that the administration has a clue what's going on. Don't we need to hold this up, this Yemen issue right here, and say to the American people, this is what happens, and I asked this question earlier to Catherine, I ask it to you, this is what happens when your government lies to you about being at war. Well, exactly right, and, and way back after 9-11, uh, many of us said that, uh, you know, Congress has got to declare war and uh, go after these organizations and not just the nation states that previously were uh, targeted uh, by any kind of declaration of war. But we are at war, have been since 1979 when they took our hostages in Tehran. Let's get real. We have to look at the uh, threats against America, against our borders, 
what's uh, targeted overseas, our embassies. We are at war now. Don't we should not kid ourselves to that and remain naive. This president doesn't realize it, and uh, we need to be poor, put on a war footing because it's going to get worse before it gets better, Ed. We need to look at this because, as I mentioned earlier, many people will say this is only Yemen. Big deal. It's the other side of the world. But guess what? It will come back to haunt us sooner or later. That's the terrible truth of the matter. Major General Paul Vallely, always a pleasure. Catherine Zimmerman, a pleasure to have you on the show as well. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking to you both again. Thank you, Ed. All right, take care. Before we move on, we do want to point out that Ted Cruz made his announcement today that said he wants to be president of the United States. So we are asking you today a very simple question. I want answers on this from the American people, from those around the world. Here's the question. What would make you run to vote for or run away from Ted Cruz as president of the United States? It's a very simple question. Tweet us at at Midpoint TV. Send us a Facebook post at facebook.com slash midpoint TV. Go there and also send an email to contact at newsmaxtv.com. Let's see if America's got the stones to tell us about the negative and the positive here. Stand by. We have the stones every day. This is Midpoint. We will continue. <laughs>